welcome back to Modern Horror. Unfortunately, large delay aside, I'd like to start 2017 with a quick look at anthology horror. Now, for anyone unfamiliar with the style, an anthology is a feature-length film that consists of several short films, often strung together with a framing story. Stuff like the, uh, the Creep Show series that used a fictional 50s-style horror comic book to transition between stories, or uh, The House That Dripped Blood, which is not to be confused with The House That Dripped Blood on Alex. We'll get to that at some point, I'm sure, but I just don't know if I can handle with so right now. You are tearing me apart! In a lot of ways, these anthologies are like a pre-packaged short film festival without the travel and the temporary nature of a film festival, which appeals to genre fans, because of the opportunity to sample a bunch of horror stories, styles, and directors. And it also appeals to non-fans by providing a much larger variety and a less intense experience. So while any given movie might be hit or miss, the misses don't last as long, and many people will find stories that they liked. Now, it really seems like a win-win for production companies and small-time directors, and anthologies got wide theatrical releases that did pretty good numbers throughout most of the 80s. But then the idea almost died out in the 90s and early 2000s when the majority of anthologies were cheaply done direct-to-video affairs. However, we've recently begun to see a resurgence of relatively high-profile anthology horror in theaters and especially on streaming services, with the, uh, the VHS series, the ABCs of Death, highly thematic collections like Holidays, A Christmas Horror Story, or Tales of Halloween. And a lot of these will have really, really interesting interlocking stories like Southbound or Trick or Treat. But today, I'd like to just have a little bit of campy fun and watch Snoop Dogg's Hood of Horror. Hi, doggy. You're... To get some backstory on our narrator, we jump into an animated action sequence where Snoop Dogg's Hi, doggy. Devin is the gunner in a car chase, presumably between rival gangs, or he is using a very different definition of war driving. His side wins pretty conclusively by exploding the other car, which yeah, seems like a bit of an overreaction. Dramatic effect, though. It's a Pyrrhic victory, though, because we learn that in the initial crossfire, Devin's little sister was hit and killed. Blaming himself for killing her, he goes on an urban walkabout. Devin eventually runs into the gangster he thought that he blew up, or at least it looks like the guy, and the reaction of, you know, shooting the surprisingly not exploded dude another half dozen times seems appropriate, you know? Spray and pray has a whole new meaning against the demonic. When he laughs off the bullets, they get down to business. If Devin kills himself, his sister comes back to life. So without a moment's hesitation, Devin just goes for it. This guy doesn't do anything halfway, really. Unholy undead daughter. Well, actually, the mom accepts the recently undeceased child pretty easily, which I suppose is a good thing. I mean, how much would it have sucked if Devin offed himself for his sister and then the mom just went all Romero on the kid? You know, hopefully this doesn't work like Pet Cemetery. Anyway, it's resurrections all around as Devin comes back, complete with uh, sweet ink and a new suit. See, he's become a hound of hell, tasked with confronting sinners with the errors of their ways and delivering their souls to hell for punishment if they refuse to course correct. Oh yeah, whatever you do, do it with style. But getting into the first story, we arrive in Mount CGI Hills Cemetery to follow a girl to her mother's grave where she swears vengeance upon gangbangers for her murder. And every chance I get to send those gangbanging bastards like Bobby to hell, I'm gonna do it. Do we get lucky or is this just like a weekly thing? Anyway, not one to leave us hanging, Snoop reappears to let us know that our lead in this story is a street artist named Posey before popping back out to let some stock footage play. Once we return to street level, a small group of people are walking down an alleyway when the fifth wheel friend here gets angry at the posy tag because it's... Pink? Oh. Some pink shit on our walls? Hell no! They're crossing it out when Posey just so happens to show up and confront them, and that escalates until the odd man out pulls a gun. So Posey sprays him in the face with uh, paint and runs away. But just when she thinks she's free and clear, she runs into a roof-dwelling Benny Trejo, who knocks her out and brings her to his, uh, his combination lair slash tattoo parlor. The unrequested ink causes some trippy flashbacks to the murder-suicide of her parents, and she awakens with... Behold the beauty of the power that you now carry. <laughs> oh, really, I'm not exactly sure what power that is. It's tight. Hmm. Well, let's find out. 
She makes this huge logical leap and decides that her crossing out this guy's tag causes his death from lack of penis. So drunk with power, Posey begins killing gangsters indiscriminately. Ring around the rosy, wall full of posy. She had the power for the hour, but she chose me. Wrong way, what you say? Hey, she didn't do it right. Now it's a nice what a waste of oh, beer. You just might, cause this life, fright night with a little more bite. I'm kicking back, sitting on my phone. Fire behind me, murder, murder, blind me. Half pint beside me, my comrade, my. Now finally, Posey begins working on the mural that she promised her pastor she would do when uh, Danny Trejo shows back up. He's here to clarify that what he apparently meant about the power to take life was... Don't. Which is really unfair since he was so vague initially. I mean, instructions unclear committed mass murder. Now he strips her of her powers before zombified versions of her first three victims appear. Now they call back to the way the second guy died and stabbed the spray can into her head, which covers the wall for a mural in paint and brain man. Now in the morning, the pastor decides to unveil the thing anyway, which the zombies have finished in the rather peculiar medium of spray paint and gore. You know, who the thought that zombie gangsters would be really into floral patterns? Wait, has nobody given any thought to the fact that that is going to get rank and real moldy real soon? What? Danny Trejo was Snoop Dogg the whole time? He goes animated again and reconstitutes Posey from the goo on the wall and they all hop back into the elevator to hell. Now this segment, uh, Crossed Out, is the weakest story of the three that we've got in this movie. I think the message is clear, but all of these stories are supposed to be about choices. And I don't know if they did a really good job setting up the choice in this one. Because I'm not certain if this is about having power and not using it, having power of good and evil but choosing petty revenge, or being able to create art but choosing destruction instead. We really have no idea if she had any other power beyond murder via unlikely accidents. Maybe if she had actually started working on the mural and flowers grew, or suddenly there was less trash around, but uh, you know, she chose revenge anyway, it would have clarified the powers and made the moral stronger. I mean, come on, Snoop, you're the storyteller. This is your job, put your game face on. Anyway, the next story is brought in with this ridiculous Texas Longhorn hood ornament and equally ridiculous cowboy-styled asshole and trophy wife. Inside the condo, there are a bunch of old dudes just chilling when Tex and Trophony roll in and introduce themselves, and holy shit, the guy's name actually is Tex. Tex Woods Jr. Going for the low-hanging fruit on this one, aren't you, Irish? Anyway, Tex's dad was the well-respected former commander of these guys' military unit during Vietnam, and unfortunately he has passed recently, leaving Tex with uh, a sizable inheritance. How much do we get? If he lives here with these men for one year to learn honor and integrity. You mean he actually expects us to live in some ghetto rat trap with a bunch of colored folks? What a jackass. Anyway. Now, despite the sarcasm wafting off Tex, the men respected his father so much that they're thrilled to have him there. It's an honor. Tex Senior was a great man. Now, as if what we've already seen hasn't been enough to prove that Tex is maybe sort of kind of a bit of a dick, he tells Roscoe that Roscoe needs to give up the master bedroom so that he and the lady can have some privacy. Uh -huh. And because Roscoe is such a stand-up guy, he accommodates them. I guess that's it. Continuing Tex's characterization as a mustache-twirling Disney villain, he comes down after the arrival of the group's caretaker, Wanda, to generally mock their happiness and, uh, you know, leer at the young woman and then claim that the group just owes them a lot of money. I've had my accountant do a detailed analysis of y'all's household budget, household impound account, and to which y'all will be signing over your pension checks until I am made whole. You already are whole. You are an asshole. Now, I don't think I really need to get any more in depth with this guy being another asshat, so I present Mine is an Evil Montage. Wait, 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 hold, hold on, hold on. Is it allowed to kill someone in a montage, but then not have clips of comical attempts to dispose of the body or uh, propping it up like Weekend at Bernie's?
Anyway, later, after Roscoe storms out of Tex's gluttony chamber in anger, he decides to break into the guy's freezer in the basement and steal the really good food that he's been hoarding away. Unfortunately, he finds Wanda's frozen corpse. Now, I'm glad that that answers that question, though it really took him a long time to pay that off. Anyway, the body count continues to rise as Stevens unfortunately succumbs to his lack of medication, though his passing does spur the men to battle. Men, it's time. Now, finally, the payoff to this whole time that we've spent watching Tex be a creepy asshole. Make it stop. Make it stop. Hey, Junior! Thank you, Roscoe, for punching this man. You've done us all a great service. We get a pretty trippy sequence here as Tex wakes up under the leaky sink that he refused to fix, which the vets have cleverly repurposed as a waterboard. Now after a few days of torture, they collect him and then start morbidly marching him around in Steven's wheelchair. And then upstairs, where they've been force-feeding his wife caviar in a scene that looks like it's been taken directly from Seven, the musical. What's in the fire? Daddy wanted us to teach you Anna and integrity. Life is full of choices, Junior. Time for yours. Given an ultimatum, unsurprisingly, Tex picks his life over hers, and the vet's exploder got somehow by using a vacuum cleaner to pump a bucket full of fish eggs into her stomach. The room now looking like the aftermath of an explosion at the hot dog factory, they all leave with Roscoe explaining that honor is Tex leaving the room alive as promised. Now, however, before they can get to the integrity portion of the lesson, Tex gets Roscoe's name wrong during some sniveling, and they shove him down the stairs where he's impaled in the neck, which serves the horny bastard right. This story, I think, worked a lot better than the previous one because it seemed to have a much tighter focus on the moral and better explained a lot of the action. Now, partially because of the characters always playing obvious caricature and the jokes all sitting deeply entrenched in the gutter, it was very clear what the writers were hoping to accomplish. It's not a brand of humor that I particularly enjoy most of the time, but it was pretty short and fun enough to watch, especially due to the just desserts at the end. Now, before we can get to the final scene, this story does have a brief epilogue. Well, it's more like a really unnecessary transition where Snoop shows up while the three surviving vets enjoy a nice Christmas, compliments the decor, and then shoots the dog for no fucking reason before letting the imp puke in the punch bowl. What an asshole! It's just uncalled for. What'd that dog ever do to you? And then we cut right to the final scene, Rhapsody Askew. Opening on a robbery in progress. So these two guys are Quan and S.O.D., a beat maker and MC team who basically hooked up like this. As I think I found my calling, I promise you, I'll live to serve and serve to live. Amen. And thusly, they teamed up and made a recording a rap album montage. Which leads directly into Snoop announcing at a low-rent award show, and this backdrop looks like wrapping paper. I kind of expect to zoom in and see, like, Christmas trees or, I don't know, cherries or something. S.O.D. shows up and Snoop tries to get an interview but gets blown off, and then gives a monologue about, I don't know, hubris, I guess, before the special effects shot so nice we ought to watch it twice. <laughs> Anyway, Snoop wants to kick back and watch the show, so he pimps his demon girls to go blow the limo driver and puts his feet up and back. Inside, S.O.D. wins his award and then goes up to, you know, thank all the usual suspects and his fallen partner, Quan. A while later, at the after party, S.O.D. being thematic is showing off his bullet scars and using the sob story of his friend's death to try to score with the honeys. The security tries to shut him down, but his self-righteous ass just isn't having it. The party gets interrupted again when Lin Shay finally appears to make everything really trippy. We get a couple of flashbacks with our first one here being S.O.D. and Quan negotiating with a record exec. 500 LS Coupe. 
black. Ooh. The 22s on it. Negotiating is being generous. It's really just S.O.D. making absurd ego field demands before storming off when he doesn't get the full star treatment he thinks he's owed. With his big head out of the room, the exec tries to offer Quan a solo contract, but he refuses out of loyalty to S.O.D. Going solo? Quan saved your ass there. Eventually, we get back to the robbery, which opens up with S.O.D. giving Quan a lot of Come on, baby, take me back. I changed, I swear. Lines before going for a, a booze run. Then all of a sudden, the guy busts into the shop and starts robbing the cashier before switching gears to Quan. Put your hands up! Fuck that! I'm not giving you my tags! Sorry. Wrong answer. And at that, he shoots Quan in the head and then really obviously changes his aim to shoot S.O.D. in the arm before running away. This, I, you know, I just can't believe we showed up at that spot right when it got hit. It My God, man, you are not fooling anyone at this point. Even Quan thinks you're full of shit and he's dead. Just wait. You'll be tripping soon enough. Though dead Quan is really way more wisecracky and chipper than alive Quan. Is this supposed to be some sort of like hip hop Freddy Krueger? Heard you guys were. Bootleg and some hot new videos. I brought one of my favorites. Get me watch. They look over the robbery again, except from another angle, and then Quan invokes some bullshit computer analysis to show that SOD was wearing a bulletproof vest like he was expecting something. Though, in all seriousness, I feel like it'd be completely in SOD's character to have body armor on at all times, because he thinks he's just such a huge star that someone would try to pop him at any time. Wasting film, Dead Quan takes advantage of his zombiness to uh, be a bit gross before the door reappears. Actually, you know, watching this a little bit more, I don't think Freddy Krueger is right. Quan is acting more like a uh, clown from the Spawn movie. Does the handbook for the recently deceased include a chapter on scenery chewing or something? Anyway, SOD's bodyguard Jersey is at the door with some floozies trying to entice Quan to the after after party but he's still wigging out about, you know, his zombified dead best friend. As part of his babbling, S.O.D. confesses that he and Jersey did in fact conspire to kill Quan, who decides that the scene really isn't going anywhere, so he stabs Jersey in the eyes. S.O.D. tries to uh, stab Quan, but that which is already dead may not die. Damn! How many times they gonna kill a nigga? So the girls pop back in to see Jersey dead and S.O.D. holding Damn. knives. Wait, wait, I can explain. At which point, Quan baits S.O.D. with a final choice to repent and fade away in jail, or go out in a blaze of glory at the height of his fame. And that answers that question. We go animated again, and the elevator blasts down to a hood of horrors. There's a final wrap-up speech by Snoop about how he just brings punishment to those who squander opportunities to do good, which, of course, launches into a rap. Welcome to the place where all the creatures meet. The last building on the left on the... The music video part here is mostly clips from each of the shorts, but there are some new shots of the party down in hell with our characters in the background. Something really amuses me about the way the Tex is dancing in the corner here. We close on the mischievous imp getting back into the elevator and going up to Earth for some more sinners. This third part here seems to take on a little bit more nuance than the other two, maybe because S.O.D. was just greedy and self-centered and not racist and deliberately abusive like Tex. While they both had a few obvious paths to redemption, it seemed way more likely that S.O.D. might have actually taken one. Snoop popping back in to deliver little morality quips was a little distracting, and he showed up a lot more in this one than he did in the other shorts, but, you know, I can't really complain too much since it's Snoop Dogg. I mean, the dude is cool. Now, anyway, there's not really a ton to dissect here since the movie has no real intentions of being grand and terrifying. All the shorts are just very campy and fun, and it's always good to see different perspectives come to horror. Horror has been mixed with metal since the 80s, so coming at it from hip-hop instead is, is a really unique feel. Well, anyway, that's it for this modern horror. Next time we'll be finally finishing up Paranormal Activity in the Ghost Dimension. But until then, please leave any comments below, like and subscribe to be notified of new videos, or follow Build Environment on Facebook or Twitter. Cheers! Detective, I think you're looking for me. Down, motherfucker, down! <laughs>